Uh, thanks everybody for coming here today. My name is Kyle Mathis. Uh, I go by Turtle Smithy. I, uh, I'll tell a little more about that in a second, but um, this panel is scaling costumes to, uh, to yourself and uh, it's a roadmap designed to help you construct costumes or props that scale to your body. Um, it will have some parts uh, for like general costume uh, construction and organizing as well. Um, I'll probably kind of skim through some areas uh, just based on the knowledge that you probably have basic and a basic idea of tools and materials, but I can backtrack and talk more about specific things at the end. Um, uh, I've just got a fair bit to cover here, so we'll, we'll just kind of go through it. And if you have any questions uh, or you see something that I go, might like skim over and you want me to go into more detail about it later, just uh, keep those ideas in your head or write them down. And at the end, I can uh, do a Q&A, okay? Cool, so first off, who am I? Uh, as I said, I'm Kyle, Turtle Smithy, uh, formerly EX Shadow, a lot of different titles there, but um, I've been a crafter since I was a kid uh, and an artist as well. And uh, I consider myself kind of a jack of all crafts, uh, master of a few and uh, I've loved making things my whole life. Um, I was the first C2E2 crown champion, um, and I've been hiding since then. <laughs> uh, but I, I worked for Art of Wigs for eight years. Uh, I made a simplicity pattern one time. Uh, I think it's somewhere on the internet. I don't know where it is anymore. <laughs> uh, but these days, I own and run my own Etsy shop, and uh, I like to make little costume accessories and props. Um, and that's where I'm at right now. So from zero to costume in five easy steps, kind of. Um, so we're going to talk about reference images, and then we're going to talk about scaling, which is the main reason for the panel. Um, but I'm going to continue on and also give a little bit of insight into tools and materials to look out for. And uh, I'm also going to talk about how you want to structure your project, uh, not only for the scale, but also for how it will fit into uh, storage and travel. Um, something not everybody thinks about when they start on their costume, uh, but very important. And then uh, very briefly, just kind of doing the thing. Um, there's only so much info I can give for a costume as a whole because costuming is vast. <laughs> it's, it's a galaxy in, in and of itself. So um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end for Q&A for more specifics. So to get started, uh, it may seem obvious, but I'm still going to go into it. You're going to want to get reference images, and you're going to want to get as many as possible when you're starting a project. Um, I like to get front, back, side, portrait, and top down. Um, to start with if they're available. And uh, detail close-ups are always great. Um, and if you have photos of your character or your prop um, in comparison to other people or objects to show its scale, those are great because uh, you want to get an idea of how big or small the thing is um, before you decide how big or small you want to make it. And uh, if the, uh, the game company or the show maker, or, like the source of your character or prop has official measurements, those, are, those can come in handy. So like if your character, uh, like a lot of anime characters will have a, a height and that'll be on a website or a wiki somewhere, um, that can come in handy. Um, if you're worried about trying to make yourself a little taller or a little shorter or something, um, it, it helps a little bit. Um, so where do you get your reference images? Well, there's a million options. Um, if it's a, well, just about anything these days is going to have some form of concept art. Um, it's more common with video games, but um, I feel like there's more and more references for anime and manga nowadays as well. Um, a lot of times there will be a manga version, even if it doesn't start as a manga. Sometimes they'll make a manga for it afterwards. Um, there might be a show version, whether it's an anime, a movie, live action. Um, and there's uh, going to be game versions because also sometimes it starts as an anime and then they make a video game out of the anime. So like it's really great. Like there's usually multiple media sources for your character or prop depending on how popular it is. Um, even within a game, sometimes a game will have like the main game graphics and then they'll have higher quality cutscenes with like cinematics. Um, Square Enix loves to do this. They make like the craziest movie graphics you've ever seen for like two cutscenes out of the game. Um, or like for a trailer. 
uh, and also figures. Figures are becoming more and more prevalent for literally everything, and we love it because those are great for references. Um, you ever seen like the old 90s cartoons where their hair just flipped from side to side because they were just mirroring it to cut the budget, and then somebody has to figure out how to make that a figure? Well, the figure is a good reference if, uh, if they did their homework. So it's, it's really great. Um, and also, uh, GIFs or animations are usually helpful because it gives you an idea of the movement. Um, now this is with an asterisk because uh, animators uh, like to cheat physics a lot and we'll talk about that more in a minute. But um, besides all of that, um, you can also look to fellow cosplayers or artists for inspiration. Um, there's a lot of really neat fan art and sometimes cosplayers will come up with their own ideas. Um, however, uh, if it's something particularly unique to that artist or cosplayer, you might want to ask them for permission if you are going to take the same idea. Um, and also post credit if you uh, post photos of your costume afterwards. Be like, I got this idea for this detail from this other person. Um, never hurts. Um, might save you a little bit of drama. So with props in particular, uh, I like to get reference images that are flat if I can um, to, to get a, a good like um, sense of like the, the symmetry and the proportions. Um, so concept art again is usually good because the uh, concept art for a prop is usually drawn flat uh, without any kind of angles involved. Um, but sometimes you can get pretty good angle shots in game as well. So the, uh, the big sword uh, in the middle of of this area, the Deathbringer. Um, that's like an in-game reference, but it's mostly spot on, so like it's still a pretty good reference for me. Um, if you're using uh, angled shots from a game or a show, um, but you know that it's not quite perfect, you can take uh, one side of it versus the other and then just mirror it if you're like tracing uh, parts of it for a pattern or anything. Um, and you can also take in, into consideration if you're pretty sure that one part is skewed a little bit, you can adjust that afterwards. Um, uh, also, if a prop transforms, uh, again, getting animated GIFs of the transformation can be useful. Um, <laughs> this is uh, one example of where my presentation has kind of overlapping images and it was supposed to click to show those extra things. So some of my images may be a little more chaotic since I can't go through the slides properly, so I apologize for that. Um, poor Stark is hidden by uh, Bloodborne. <clears throat> but anyway, the animations nonetheless. And let's say you're doing a mascot. Um, they're a little less common these days than they used to be. Uh, I actually did a lot of big builds in my early days and I don't really do them as much anymore because I just don't have the space for them. Um, but if you are interested in doing mascots, then you're gonna wanna uh, make reference images of yourself in the same positions as the reference images you get of the mascots. And uh, there's a lot of different programs you can use to kind of uh, uh, make your, your own person images uh, translucent and overlay it on top of the images of the character. Um, like you see with the big daddy in the center here, uh, I took a picture of myself in the same just kind of standard standing pose and uh, I just photoshopped it on top of the, the concept art and lined it up so that I could get an idea of where I need to build myself out to make myself bigger for the mascot. Um, a lot of characters are pretty simple. They just have big heads or maybe slightly longer arms or legs. Um, so it's not too hard to make a mascot if that's what you're aiming for. Um, but if it's something crazy like the bottom right one where like it's just got a huge, huge arm and a giant head with huge horns, um, that can take a little more engineering. And so like having, ref again, having references of yourself in the same kinds of poses to get an idea of what is the difference between me and this thing uh, is a good starting point for you. <coughs> so let's move on to scaling. That's the primary focus of this panel, um, but uh, it's, there's a lot to it, obviously. Uh, my favorite website, I'm gonna actually say if you've got a phone on you and you wanna punch it in real quick, uh, go to Knife Gun Cosplay. Uh, you can just Google search it. You don't have to do a .com or anything, but it's uh, N-I-F-E-G-U-N Cosplay. Um, it's a neat little website, very simple. All it does is it lets you upload a photo and then you have a baseline 
and uh, it's it, it can be like a little fidgety on the phone, but you should be able to use like touch screen to move the anchor points of a baseline uh, and line it up with a part of the image. And at the top of the screen, you can put a dimension for that first line. So like say I put a baseline on this scythe for the blade of um, 31 inches. So every new line you add after that will scale off that first line. Um, this is especially helpful for uh, reference images with a person in it. You can make the baseline be the height of the person, but put in your own height as the dimension, and then everything else will scale off of that to your height, basically. Um, I probably should have put that in the reference here, but just so you know, like get something with a person in it and use the height as your baseline most of the time, and you can make as many lines as you want to scale other parts of that image uh, relatively accurately. Obviously, you're, you're using anchor points with your fingers. You can kind of zoom in on the phone, and it also works pretty well on the computer, um, but this is a really great way to quickly get a, a pretty decent idea of um, what some of your uh, dimensions will be in an image based on math. Um, so I love this website. It does a lot of the work for me. Uh, I use it to break down different parts of a prop usually. So like in this image you can see uh, line one is just like the handle of the scythe. Um, line two, the orange one, is like the upper part going down to about the midsection where there's a hinge. And then the, uh, the blue line below it is the other part of the scythe. And then there's like other lines for different parts of it, you know? So that gives me a really good idea so that I can like cut the different parts uh, out of like PVC or something uh, at the right dimension. And if it's uh, not quite perfect, you know, you can kind of hone it in from there once you've gotten a start with it. Um, but yeah, I love it. Uh, you can also potentially use uh, like this image. You can like screenshot this once you've got all your lines in. Like I, I really recommend saving it so that you've got it for later. And uh, you can put it in Photoshop and uh, usually like I'll draw a box inside of the uh, image and put a line for the measurements to, so that I'll know how big a sheet of paper is in this uh, image. And then I can just duplicate that box uh, as many times as I need to uh, make printouts. And I'll print it out uh, for like a life-size pattern. Um, it's a little tricky and I'm sure there's probably other programs besides Photoshop that can do this. Um, I just default to Photoshop, like find, find like an old pirated version, don't pay them subscription, they don't deserve it. But um, yeah, I'm not sponsored by <laughs> Adobe. <laughs> um, okay, so aside from techno using technology, um, there's some simpler ways that you can uh, figure out proportions as well. Um, I like to call it the rule of thumb. Um, and I'm kind of being punny here, but um, your thumb is a good source of reference for measurements because typically the thing you're referencing has a thumb. So you can look at their thumb and see how many thumb widths it is uh, f to measure something that's in your image and then use your own thumb to get that many thumb widths to, to duplicate it in real life. Um, I'm kind of lucky, my thumb is exactly one inch <laughs> or at least when I press it down slightly. So like it's basically an inch. So like it's really easy for me to do measurements uh, with the old US measurement system. Um, also, uh, if, you, if you're trying to learn metrics, uh, an inch is close to 2.5 centimeters. Um, I, I try to use that to remind myself if I need to convert one way or another. Um, so that's pretty easy. Um, body parts in general can be used as measurements, so like consider the width of a hand, uh, the distance from a wrist to the elbow, um, an eyeball is about an inch wide on average. Um, doesn't help you if your anime character has huge eyes, but a lot of video game characters have more realistic proportions and like live action. So you can use eyeballs on your reference image if they're a, a normal size to uh, get an idea of like inches on the face if they've got like a hat or a helmet or a tattoo or something. Um, but um, what, I'm, what I would impress on you is to get used to observing. Um, observation is the superpower of artists. It's the ability to just kind of make rational um, like c connections between one thing and another based on what you see. 
So uh, the more you get used to observing uh, how long or wide something is in real life on your person, uh, the easier it becomes to uh, not have to think very hard about how big something is uh, in a reference image. Um, like sometimes I'll just use details in the reference image like a, a button like a button that looks like it's a half an inch to an inch. I can use that as a measurement for other things on the image, like how many buttons wide is the coat or a pocket, you know? So like it's, it's kind of coming up with abstract ways to measure. It makes it easier over time for you to be able to guesstimate uh, what your proportions are on anything. Um, so another fun thing you can do is uh, if you have a figure statue reference, um, there's this thing called Glad Press and Seal. It's a uh, kitchenware. Uh, it's like better than saran wrap because it's a little bit thicker. It doesn't really stretch, but it sticks to things without li leaving much residue. So you can use Glad Press and Seal for pattern making. Um, generally speaking, you can use it for pattern making on yourself. But if you have a figure, you can make a, a tiny pattern on your figure and then carefully peel it off. Be very careful not to destroy your figure. Um, but uh, you can put this uh, pattern that you've made onto a piece of paper, take a picture, upload it into knife gun, and then figure out the dimensions to blow it up bigger to scale to yourself. Um, so go moving on to tools, um, I can do more talk about the, the scaling stuff at the end, but I'm just going to breeze through some more basics here. And uh, also with tools and materials, if people want to hear more about a specific one, I can talk about those later. But some basic tools you'll want are pens, pencils, sharpies, rulers, scissors and hoppy knife, drafting paper, painter's tape, heat gun. Like, it's a lot, but like, they're basic things that you can use for just about any project. I always want these things on hand when I'm starting something new. Um, also, uh, sanding tools, as you get into things that need sanding. Um, there's a Dremel called the Stylo. It's in the middle of the picture here, uh, the nice lady with the yellow fingernails. Um, it's, a, it's like $50, and it's, it's really easy to hold in the hand. It's not chunky like some of the bigger Dremels are, but it's still got enough power to it that you can sand Ava foam um, or like some resins. Like I use it on most things, and it's fine but like $50 and it's small. I love that thing. Um, but you can also invest in some sanding files. Uh, the uh, iron shaped thing uh, below the Dremel is called a detail sander. Uh, those things vibrate to sand. Um, they're really great for general coverage sanding on a prop or something. Um, and they're like 30 to 50 bucks, I wanna say. I could be lying to myself about that, but I feel like that's right. Um, and if you get really deep into prop making, you might invest in a belt sander. That's a real workhorse for a lot of sanding. Um, but those are some things to kind of put on your to get list as you get into the hobby. Um, and for like filler, I really like epoxy sculpt. It's just like a little resin clay. Um, it's pretty easy to find online. I think Joann's usually sells it as well. Um, but epoxy sculpt is great for details. Uh, if you could. Yeah, you can take pictures. Uh, I'll try to upload this somewhere at some point in the future too, um, if you want the, the fancier version of the, of the presentation. Um, and there's also 3M Acryl Green Spot Putty. Uh, I haven't used that as much, but it, a lot of people will use that for like little uh, imperfections in a prop or something if you're trying to get a smooth surface and it's got like little divots or something or like a 3D print that's got like the break lines where you're attaching two pieces together. Um, so there's those things. Um, glues. Uh, so I'm going to get a little fancy here. And uh, if you know super glue, its scientific name is cyanoacrylate. I tell you this because you can search that to get like bigger amounts of it uh, for better prices. Uh, don't go to a hardware store unless you're really desperate for a last minute little bit of super glue. Um, I usually go with Bob Smith Industries, but they sell like eight ounce bottles of super glue. Like that lasts you a long time. You get like two or three costumes worth out of that super glue. And uh, I'm a big fan of super glue. It's, it is a dangerous glue. So like 
definitely look up on the, the health and safety for using super glue. It, it can have a little bit of fumes to it, um, and like it can stick your fingers together, but um, it, it'll also stick just about anything together. So like I really like it as a, a quick fix for anything. Um, getting into contact cement can be helpful, spray adhesives. Um, spray adhesives are really messy, but they're really good for big coverage, especially with like fabric types. Um, hot glue is still there. I would recommend a very high temperature hot glue if you're going to use it. Uh, and two part epoxies. Uh, there's websites like this to that.com that can give you an idea of what kinds of glue to use for specific bondings. But also, I just generally like to have a, a lot of different options uh, of glue to, to glue things together. So if one thing doesn't work, I just try another. Um, I didn't mention it, but. Uh, E6000 is also a really good glue to have. Um, my wife likes it a lot more than I do, but it's it's there. And Gorilla Glue, you know, just have a lot of glues. And finally, painting. Uh, it's really good to have acrylics. I think that's the baseline for any kind of, uh, like, costumer is just cheap old acrylics. Uh, you can do a lot with them. You don't necessarily have to have super fancy airbrushes or HVLPs to make things. Um, that's more if you want to go into like professional grade prop making. Um, but basic acrylics, I've used them for 20 years and I'm still using them. Uh, Plasti Dip is good for Ava foam. It comes in a spray can. You can get it at hardware stores. Um, it's good to kind of seal your foam so that you can use your acrylic paints on top. Um, spray paints are good for a lot of hard surface things. And if you want to get into airbrushing, I do recommend it. It's really fun. Um, you can use acrylics in airbrushes. Um, there's tutorials on how to thin them properly, but there's also just specific acrylics made for airbrushing. And there's other paints for airbrushing too. Uh, and you'll want brushes, sponges, airbrush, solvent, uh, etc. Um, moving on to materials, uh, Ava Foam's kind of a big one. Uh, it's it's been around for a while now, and people really like it. I really like it. I use it all the time. Uh, it's called ethylene vinyl acetate. It's lightweight, easy to find, has varying thicknesses and density. Uh, you can heat shape it. Uh, just wear a respirator or use in a well-ventilated area. Um, it's adhesive friendly and it can be sealed and painted easily. Um, PVC, po polyvinyl chloride. Uh, you usually use the pipes, PVC pipes, for like cores on bigger props. Um, it can be heat shaped, but again, you want to wear a respirator uh, or use it outside, you know. Um, easy to glue, good for a core structure because it's got some flexibility to it. Um, Warbla is still around. It's not really necessary as much as it used to be because Ava foam has gotten sturdier. Um, it was a bigger deal when we just had craft foam, um, but some people still like to use it to reinforce Ava foam based projects or other creative uses. I've seen people do weird things with Warbla, so like it's there. Um, I don't hate it. Uh, I used it earlier this year on some armor. Um, it's got its own quirks. I can go more into that at the end but it's a, it's a material. <laughs> 3D printing, uh, you've probably heard of it. It's a thing. It's getting bigger every day, and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, it's, I could have my own panel on 3D printing, so I'm not going to go deep into it, but um, printers are becoming more affordable, and they're having less uh, errors, so like you don't have to troubleshoot as much as you used to. Um, I just got one called a Bamboo P1P, and it's almost an appliance. I just plug it in, and it, does, it just does the thing. Um, Learning to 3D model can be a bit to, to get into, so again, probably a different panel than this one, but it's definitely something to look into for materials. But at the end of the day, you can really use just about anything. Uh, the big mech in the middle, big O, I used mostly cardboard for that. You know, cardboard and duct tape, it literally has duct tape on it. That was like one of my real early day builds, but it's still one of my favorites because it was just so easy to build and it still looked all right, you know? Uh, and leather is really great. It's expensive, so it can be kind of scary to get into, but I love leather. It can take a lot of punishment and still work. Um, so it's great if you've got the money to put into it. Um, just like uh, the, the helmet on the right uh, started with like insulation foam and cardboard. Then I used like spray foam that you can get at a hardware store for insulation, carved it down, and then I did like paper mache and resin over it. And so like, the sky's the limit. If you want to play around with any material that pops into your head, give it a try. 
Um, so let's move on to structuring. Um, when you want to make a costume uh, with armor uh, or any kind of solid parts to it, you, I mean, honestly, even just fabric, you want to make sure that you have good mobility in it. Um, so uh, make sure that you're comfortable walking and standing. Make sure that you can do dynamic poses if you need to. Uh, make sure you can eat in it. And make sure you can poop in it. Because <laughs> you're going to need to go to the bathroom at some point. <clears throat> or at least make sure that it's something that you're not going to want to wear all day if you do need to go to the bathroom. So like you can take breaks and get out of it quickly if you need to. Um, rigging. The vast majority of rigging can be done with elastic and Velcro. It's very easy and very cheap. Um, I like to uh, do a lot of Velcro and uh, elastic at the joints uh, so that it's easy to pull off if I need to take a break, um, take some of the, the more stressful parts off. Um, the, this arm has a lot of elastic in it. It's got one right here. It's got them in here. Some of them's hidden, you know. So like, uh, those are really great ways to anchor things together, but r maintain uh, stretch and mobility. Um, but whatever you choose for your rigging, like if it's anchored onto clothing or something else, make sure it's easy to put on and take off. Um, make sure it can break down for storage and travel. Um, you'll have to think about the interconnectivity of different layers. And uh, yeah, elastic and Velcro can help with a lot of that. Uh, if you're structuring mascots, uh, <clears throat> you're, you're going to be making extensions from your body. Uh, you can consider ways to make like platforms for shoes with like insulation foam. Uh, you can make fake forearms out of just like wire or um, sticks. <laughs> the Jack Skellington in the upper right, uh, that was pretty cheap wire with, uh, I think it was like pieces from uh, like blinds. Like I just had scraps fr from like these broken uh, blinds that I used for the arms, but you could use like dowel rods or PVC. And uh, I just like masking taped over the fingers for the bone look at the end, like super cheap. This was another early one of mine. And uh, yeah, it can be pretty easy. Upholstery foam is really good for bulking out uh, costumes and uh, it's not too terribly expensive, um, especially if you use a coupon at Joann's or something, wait for sales. Um, so health and safety. Uh, I, I always try to use lightweight materials if I'm making armor or props because um, you've only got one body and you don't want to break it. Um, not everybody's a muscle maniac or a bodybuilder. Um, we all wish we were, but we got to be real sometimes. Um, so lightweight materials like Ava foam are really good and upholstery foam. Like any kind of foam is your friend, basically. Foam is friend. Uh, ventilation and hydration. Uh, you want to make sure that your costume allows you to uh, drink water and uh, make sure that like you can breathe and like not overheat too much. So like if, if it's a mascot, you've got to be able to take parts off of it easily so that you don't overheat or hyperventilate or something. Um, you got to have decent vision and that can be kind of tricky, but like you can uh, use stretchy fabrics uh, in certain places to kind of hide your face but still see through it a little bit. It's not perfect, but y if you stretch certain fabrics, you can kind of uh, have a tinted vision of the outside. Um, and there's like other things like uh, you can just hide your, your little eye holes and like different details of the costume. Um, but regardless, uh, have a helper. If you've got a big costume or a big prop, always have a helper. Um, and not just someone who says, yeah, I'll help you. And then they're like at the other side of the con five minutes later. Like you make sure you've got a dedicated friend or family member who's there with you the whole time you're wearing the costume. Because um, you just don't know when something's going to happen or you're going to suddenly be really exhausted and get like heat stroke or something. Um, you you want to have someone who can help take care of you if that happens. So if you're making a prop f or a costume, uh, consider structuring it for storage and travel. Um, the uh, Big O I made that one time, uh, it, I did not think about structuring it for storage and travel. So they, they were these giant tubes like the size of a person. And I was driving 10 hours down from Missouri to Texas for a con. And the car was already full of other people with their own costumes and, and luggage. So people had to sit with these pieces in their laps for 10 hours. Uh, but because I made it out of cardboard, I just left half the costume there at the end of the 
con so they didn't have to suffer on the way back. But you don't want to have to leave your costume at a con every time you make it, right? That, that kind of stinks. So what you want to do is uh, figure out ways to break down a, a prop or a costume um, smaller so that it can fit in a suitcase. Um, if you look at the sword, it breaks into like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pieces. And uh, it's taller than I am, but it can break down and fit in a suitcase. I've taken... Yeah, so this one has a PVC core. I love PVC for breakpoints like that because PVC has its own joint system. If you go to a hardware store, they, they sell little joints uh, for straight, angle, cross-section, uh, halfway cross-section. Like, they've got a lot of different options for you, um, even, like, slight angles. Um, they've got just about everything you could need to make whatever shape you want with it. Combine that with the fact that PVC can be heat-curved Again, use safety first, do it outside. Um, but you know you can make whatever shape you want for a core and then build around that with your prop. <clears throat> I highly recommend PVC for props and uh, not as much with armor, but um, with armor usually you're doing, um, I do recommend Ava foam over 3D prints for armor that you fly with because it's more flexible, it's not gonna break. Um, this piece actually cracked on the flight um, because I stuffed my suitcase a little too thick. It's fine. I can fix it or remake it later, but it is a hassle I don't want to have to deal with every time, so I usually will take Ava foam uh, stuff on, a, on the plane. Um, 3D prints. Uh, there's like newer filaments that have flex and, and give to them more, uh, but I don't know as much about those yet, so I'm not going to talk about them too much. <laughs> uh, TPU uh, is one to look into, but yeah. Uh, I do recommend foam for armor. <coughs> um, so uh, bungee cords are magic when you're driving. Um, all the handles on the roof of a car, you can bungee cord a little uh, carrying thing and, and stick your props in the ceiling of the car so that they're not in the way. Um, not all props, but quite a lot of them can fit up there. Um, just a little tip for Tetrising on a, on a road. And... Um, uh, as I mentioned with like flying, uh, the reason I like to specifically uh, make props fit into a suitcase is because a lot of storage bins are similar size to suitcases. So if you're making it for one, it'll fit in the other. So after you've, even if you don't know if you're going to fly with it, it's good to make it like it can fit in a suitcase just so that you have the option later. And it also means that you can put it in a storage bin more easily when you're not wearing the costume because it's got to go somewhere. <laughs> And uh, you only have so much wall space or floor space before um, you've just got too many things in your room. Or <clears throat> Mascots are really difficult to travel with. Um, it's another reason I don't do them as much anymore. Um, uh, the Ganondorf pictured here takes up four of those storage bins in the picture above it. Four whole storage bins, and I haven't worn it in like six years, seven years. <laughs> it's it's kind of a waste of space. Uh, I'll probably pull it out again here soon, but um, yeah, it's it's a big commitment of space when you make mascots, um, and that also goes for travel. Like, there's just not an easy way to fly with a mascot that big. Um, maybe if it's just a a head, like like if you do furries and like if you just got a head and the rest of it's just. Com uh, like a fursuit that's easy to compact into a suitcase, that could work. But for a lot of characters that have like a lot going on, um, you're probably stuck with driving or shipping it in crates. So mascots can be a very big commitment um, for travel. And uh, doing the same, I suggest giving yourself four times as much time as you think you need. I am terrible with time management. It just never works out for me. As I've been doing this for 20 years, I still get surprised when there's only two weeks away and I've got so many things to make still. Um, so I, I like to set myself a soft deadline, but I try to like convince myself that that is my deadline, <laughs> like my hard deadline, but it's really just a soft deadline. And then as I get closer, if I don't have everything done, I'm not actually as disappointed to not have it done yet. Um, so it's, it's good to have like low stakes deadlines for your costume initially so that you're not going to be crying when you're, it's only half complete. But I also recommend uh, try to find focal points on your costume when you're working on it. Get the real big things done and then work down to smaller details so that way 
if you run out of time, you've still got a mostly complete costume. It's just missing some things that people might not even know are missing. Um, I'm really bad at like hyper focusing on details. So like I'll spend a month on an arm instead of the whole costume, right? Whereas if you if you like try to bust out like the big pieces and then work your way down to smaller pieces, you're more likely to be able to wear the costume at the con. And if people ask, you're like, oh yeah, I just haven't done this part yet. But I, I do actually think it's a good thing to not necessarily have a finished costume for its first wear anyway, because um, it gives you a little more time to actually wear it and figure out what works with it and what doesn't work, and you can tweak it more with, uh, in between your first event and your second event, and it'll be a, a more proper costume by that second event. I'm, I'm constantly just like adding more to costumes. Um, my hunter costume that I wore last night, I've been working on it on and off for like two years, and I just keep adding little things to it. <coughs> but yeah, make a little priority list and uh, have a soft deadline. Don't be afraid to um, wear a work in, pro uh, work in progress. Speaking of work in progress, take a lot of photos. Um, when I worked on Clive from 16, uh, this Final Fantasy 16 this year, I took so many photos, um, way more than I really need. Um, you can always delete photos later, but you can't conjure photos you haven't taken. Um, photos are really good to refer back to if you're doing it the same thing in a future project. So like if, you've, if you're making armor for the first time, document the hell out of it. Because that'll help you uh, remember what you did your first time, and you can decide if that's what you want to do again or if you want to tweak something and do it differently. And uh, if, you, if it also helps, write down notes. I'm terrible with notes, but some people are good at notes, so <laughs> it's never a bad thing to d take notes. Um, I like to take uh, cheap materials for mock-ups, Amazon boxes. Everybody's got Amazon boxes. Um, you can go to a grocery store and get banana boxes or just leftover boxes from all the stuff they're putting on the shelves. Um, you can get fabric scraps from your previous projects. Just keep them in a bin somewhere. Uh, those can come in handy for patterns and mock-ups. And um, if you're trying to get more specific on things, generally uh, a, a quick Google search or a YouTube search can give you a lot of tutorial options. Um, I know algorithms are making it a little harder. AI is making the internet really stupid these days, but um, there's still a fair amount of searching that you can like find things with. Um, so I, I always recommend searching and just uh, listen to what people say. Uh, give it a try. Don't be afraid. Um, if you have friends in the cosplay community, like ask your friends, how did you do this? Um, don't be afraid. They want to tell you. Like it's not just this convention. Like people out in the world actually like telling you how they make things. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Um, let's see. Yeah, get helpers, uh, have sewing parties. It's really fun to craft with other people. It can also be really distracting, so don't watch a movie. <laughs> but uh, like, I like to do music, personally. Music doesn't have a visual element, so like, it can set a mood, it can give you energy without distracting you with visuals. Um, unless it's something that everyone agrees they've seen 50 times, um, maybe then you can put it on the background. But um, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, and I'm kind of old, so I watched Magic School Bus when I was a kid, and I really like to use Miss Frizzle's uh, l slogan, take chances, make mistakes, and get messy. Because um, you, you really don't learn without making mistakes. Um, I, I consider mistakes more valuable than success, because I can remember a mistake I made way better than I can remember a success. So um, even if they can be costly, um, they take away your fear to progress. So don't be afraid to make mistakes because you will go really far if you can power through those mistakes. And we've got 15 minutes for a Q&A. That's pretty good for me. I have a bad habit of going over. <laughs> um, so does anybody have any questions? Link. Um, use it on whatever you have handy when you need to use it, and if, you, if it doesn't work for you on that platform, then use a different platform. <laughs> uh, it, it works 
pretty similarly on all. Um, I think usually I like computers if I've got a computer nearby um, because you can see it on a bigger screen. But I don't think the computer lets you zoom, which is kind of dumb. So phones can be good for the zoom factor. Um, sometimes I can get a more accurate baseline on the handles because I can zoom in further on the phone. So I'd, I'd chalk it up to personal preference. Anybody else? Any questions? Uh, ladies first, then I'll get you. So for, for rigging and for breaking down costumes, yes. what are your favorite ways to rig them and like, attach different armor pieces? Because that's always the biggest challenge mm -hmm. when I'm trying to put these together, is how do I plan to break them apart? Yeah. So, together, Very good question. Um, most of the time, you'll be pretty lucky and the uh, game creators or cartoonists will have like a decent idea of how armor breaks down based on historical armor. So it'll have like pretty good segmentation on its own. Um, uh, as for rigging, usually if you look at historical armor, they used leather straps and studs. Um, not all uh, modern fantasy armors show that. A lot of them like to do floaties, and uh, they don't really worry about it. It's just magic. But you c there's nothing wrong with adding that extra detail for not only function, but just uh, fashion. Like, I, I personally love to add details that aren't in a costume if I feel like it, because it, it adds my signature to the costume. It makes it my version. Um, and like, there's, there's definitely a tactful way to do it uh, without going too far away from the character. So like if, you, if you're making the base shape um, and you feel like this area is really plain, I could add some studs here or I could add a little filigree or something, you can go for it. But I'm getting a little distracted. The, uh, the base question for rigging, I, I like, again, elastic and Velcro for the most part. You can use fabric or leather for actual straps, but um, look at... Um, First of all, look at the character themselves, see how they move in the show or in the video game, and see what would best mimic that in real life. If it's, if it's clipping, because um, video games love the clipping cheat, um, or they stretch, like um, typically armor is mapped in, in a video game, so you'll actually see that armor stretch like it's fabric, it's stupid. Um, a few video game companies are being smarter about it and they're actually rendering the armor separate, but most, most of the time it's just not worth it for the animators to do that. That's a lot of extra work that nobody's going to care about. Only us cosplayers care. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you look at the movement in the show or the video game, um, you can get an idea of, okay, which parts need to move to accommodate my joint. And um, if, it's, if it's a layered piece, it's a lot easier because those layers can overlap each other. So you can use elastic to connect the different layers together and the layers will overlap naturally. Um, you'll want anchor points on like the front, side, and back most of the time. Um, or you can stagger it to two, like, uh, like side front, side back. But you'll want more than just one so that it has a little bit of structure so that when it moves one way or another, it's not like blowing in the wind, you know? Um, it stays lined up with your movements. <clears throat> uh, and like Velcro or studs, you can actually fake studs even if you're not using them for function. I still like studs because it's historically accurate. Do you know that even uh, chainmail had studs um, in medieval armor? Like real chainmail had studs so that it was less likely to pull apart. Sometimes they were welded, but welding was a little less common back then, so studs were easier to uh, mass produce. And you had a question. Yes, um, someone else asked that at the beginning of the panel. And uh, if you're scaling a pattern, uh, or trying to create a pattern, um, it's, it's, what you want to do is, it, it, it helps to have a base pattern or an idea of what a base pattern is. So like definitely take some uh, like classes or watch tutorials on patterning. Um, that would be a completely separate 
panel on its own, but like let's say you've got a pattern and you just want to alter it to fit you better. Um, look for uh, a lot of patterns, commercial patterns will have a line, a center line, and a horizontal like waistline. Usually places like that are places where you can cut it and just add um, simple space between and just kind of average the curves if there are curves in between. Um, but it's not as difficult as you think. Like usually um, adding dimension to a pattern is as simple as cutting it around the middle and then expanding it and then just trying to reconnect the dots that you cut apart. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can scale the whole thing, like take a pattern and just draw a line around it, um, but that doesn't always necessarily work for you. So like, don't be afraid to um, try a couple of different things. Like you can try drawing a bigger version of the pattern and see if it fits you. If it doesn't, then you can either cut some away or cut and then expand it a little more. Um, but yeah, there's there's not really a wrong way to make a pattern bigger. It's just what it works for you in the end, but those are some easy ways to kind of try to make them bigger. <coughs> yes? Uh, I was just going to ask about more, so instead of scaling down and scaling up, more like, I, I kind of forget about using the culture foam that falls well, between 14. Um, I'm just curious, other than say, like, you're kind of a classic platform too, but like, are there any type of stilts? I know I've heard people talk about using like drywall or stilts. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, drywall stilts are pretty safe and standard. Um, I don't know what how much they cost these days, like a few hundred maybe, but um, I used to have, I think I still have a pair of drywalls that have worked like forever. So like if you, if you can wear stilts, um, then they're great to have. Uh, you just want to be aware that um, they, they basically extend directly down from your foot, so they're very wide. Um, so if you've seen people in circus outfits and they have the gigantic pants, it's because they're, the pants have to be that big to fit around the drywall stilts. I had to do that with Jack Skellington. I really hated it because he's got stick thin legs and I, it wasn't accurate to me, but it was just a sacrifice I had to make for the character. Um, if you're not buying drywall stilts, um, there are some companies that make really good digi-grade stilts for like uh, animalistic, uh, the extra joint in the leg. Um, uh, digigrade, I think, is the term you look up. Um, but there's also tutorials on how to build digigrade stilts um, and or fake it with uh, foam and uh, certain placement. Uh, but if you're just trying to get a little bit of height, I wouldn't worry about drywall. Um, what I do is usually I just make big shoes that my feet are on top of to fake the extra height. I've also considered um, uh, heel inserts. Those exist. Um, you can basically put a lot of stacked uh, foam or you can buy official heel inserts that fit inside of a shoe and it gives you a heel inside the shoe. So like it's kind of faking height without adding a, a stiletto or something on the outside. Um, but sometimes, I, again, it could be tricky because your foot might not fit properly in every shoe with heel inserts, so you have to kind of play around with it. <coughs> but uh, for platforms that you make yourself, uh, insulation foam, like Pink Panther foam, works pretty well. Like, it, it may seem brittle if it's just one layer, but if you're stacking a whole bunch of layers of it, it's not going to break. And uh, quite the opposite, your, your weight will slowly push into the, the top of the foam and give yourself a perfect foot shape. Yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, any other questions? Um, well, if you think of something later, feel free to reach out to me on social media. Uh, I go by Turtle Smithy. Sometimes there's a dash or an underscore, but it's, it's Turtle Smithy in some capacity or another. And uh, I'm always happy to answer any questions you all have. Um, and my computer is done for the day. <laughs> but anyway, thanks you all for coming, and I hope you've had a great time, and I hope you have a good rest of the day. <laughs>